So um, you can see Aaron's sister, Heather, is here all the way up from Texas. So uh, welcome. <laughs> I guess that merits applause. I don't know. Uh, yeah. And <laughs> I know I was going to get to her, but she's not here right now. Her husband, Stephen's here. Brandy's out there somewhere. You know her as Brandy Dungan. She's got a new name. She's had a new name. For how many years you've been married now? Almost 10 years. So as you know, Brandy, 24 years ago, went to China, and uh, she was smuggling Bibles into China. She was in Hong Kong for many, many years, and literally tons and tons of Bibles were, were smuggled into mainland China through Hong Kong. And uh, so that was such a blessing. We had a couple teams go over there over the years, and um, pretty awesome. Uh, the last few years, been spending half the time. Stephen's from Ireland. I was corrected; it's not Scotland, and they're not the same, right? <laughs> it's all part of Great Britain. So, what do you call? Fr you don't call it French toast? What do you? Eggy bread. bread. Yeah, that's because Great Britain they hate the French, so they won't call it French toast. I'm making that up. I have no idea if that's why. <laughs> as soon as I heard they don't like French toast, it's eggy bread. I thought, well, it must be the French. Anyway, I'm sure it's not. They love everybody. Okay, let's open in a word of prayer before we get off the rails any further. Uh, Lord, we do thank you for your word as we come before you. We pray that you would speak to our hearts. Uh, give us ears to hear what your spirit is saying as we look at this amazing section of scripture in Acts chapter 2. And Lord, we pray that we would be open to what you want to do in each one of our lives, and we commit this time to you now, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So turn in your Bibles to Acts 2. As we come into this section of Scripture, we find the disciples doing exactly what Jesus told them to do. He said, wait in Jerusalem until you're endued with power from on high. And he was talking about the promise of the Father that would come upon them which is the Holy Spirit, because it would be the empowering of the Holy Spirit who would enable all of his followers to be witnesses of Jesus' death, his burial, his resurrection, to a lost, dying, hurting people throughout the world. But it all began here in Acts chapter 2, and this is really the turning point um, in God's plan for this sinful world. Jesus has just fulfilled everything that he was uh, required to do, why he came from heaven to earth. He represented the Father perfectly, his ministry was perfect, his life was perfect, and thus he alone qualified to be the perfect sacrifice and the final sacrifice for the sins of the human race. Now, the proof of Jesus being the perfect sacrifice was that he rose from the dead, he conquered the grave. And after giving them final instructions, he ascended back up into heaven, as we saw earlier in chapter 1. But now we see the Holy Spirit descending from heaven to earth. And here in chapter 2, we see the Holy Spirit coming upon those 120 disciples in the upper room. This is when the church was born. This is when the body of Christ, the bride of Christ, came to life. And in Acts 2, we'll see the first harvest of souls being saved. And since... Sin is now paid for through the blood of Jesus, since salvation is available to everyone through the resurrection of Christ. Jesus fills his people with the Holy Spirit. He empowers them. Uh, he motivates them with God's love so that they can be instruments through which Jesus will work and through which Jesus will save others. And so the reason that God did this is so that he could reach more and more people. The season of God's grace through faith alone and Christ alone began on this day, the day of Pentecost. It'll continue to the rapture of the church. We'll talk a little bit about this on Wednesday, but the church, the bride of Christ, are only those who came to faith in Jesus from Pentecost to the rapture. And then you've got other saints, Old Testament saints, you've got tribulation saints, but the bride of Christ is from this day that the church was born until the rapture when Jesus takes his bride home. So we'll see that the bride, the body of Christ, it's made up of Jews and Gentiles, uh, boys and girls, male, female, bond and free, you know, from every tribe, every tongue, every nation, every people group, 
You know, this is an amazing kaleidoscope of all those who have believed in, who have received Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Now, there's a couple of parallels that we see with the day of Pentecost and what we see in the Old Testament. For example, when Solomon was dedicating the temple, uh, as soon as he dedicated the temple, his fire came down from heaven, it consumed the altar, the, the burnt offering on the altar. And so here in Acts 2, we see the Holy Spirit coming down as flaming tongues of fire seated upon all the disciples' head. At that moment, born-again believers are now the temple of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 6.19, it says, Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? Recently in Exodus 32, we saw that on that day when Moses came down from Mount Sinai, he's carrying the two tablets, the Ten Commandments, the law, and 3,000 Israelites will be put to death as they worship the gold calf. On the day of Pentecost, we'll see that 3,000 will come to faith, come to life, as Jesus pours out His Spirit and the Gospel is preached. There's many others, but there was only one official day of Pentecost, and that's what we're going to look at this morning here in Acts chapter 2. This is a one-time event when the Spirit came from heaven to earth. And even as there is only one official day of Passover, it was fulfilled, even though they practiced Passover for 1,500 years, it was fulfilled when Jesus died on the day of Passover as the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. This is a one-time event with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit from heaven to earth on the day of Pentecost. And so just as you and I needed to receive Jesus Christ as our Savior, we also need to believe and receive what the Holy Spirit wants to do in all of our lives as well. So in that sense, we all need to, in a, in a sense, experience our own personal day of Pentecost with the Lord. We need the Holy Spirit to come upon us, to refill us as believers day after day after day. So what we're looking at this morning, it cannot be duplicated in other words, don't expect to hear the sound of a mighty rushing wind. Don't expect, expect to see little flames of fire over anybody's heads. This was a once-for-all unique event as the bride and body of Christ come to life. So let's look at chapter 2. Let's read a few verses here, starting in verse 1. It says, When the day of Pentecost had fully come, there we go, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So once again, the last words Jesus spoke before he ascended back up into heaven was chapter 1, verse 8 where he says, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And we talked about the three experiences of the Holy Spirit. He's with everybody in the world, convicting of sin, righteousness, judgment. When you're saved, he comes in you, but then he also wants to come upon you, strengthening you, using you for his glory. Sometimes that upon experiences, experience happens at the moment of salvation, but many times we need to be filled and refilled throughout our Christian life. Jesus had already breathed them upon the disciples, said, Receive the Holy Spirit, chapter 20 of John's Gospel, verse 22. And so the Spirit was in them, but here is when the Holy Spirit comes upon them. So he says, He'll come upon you, and you'll be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, all Judea, Samaria, and to the end of the earth. Now the day of Pentecost, it's one of the feasts that was required of all the Jewish men to attend. There were three of them, Passover, and then 50 days after Passover is Pentecost. Pentecost means 50. So 50 days after Pentecost, or, or after Passover, Pentecost takes place. Happened to be a Sunday, by the way, when the church was born. And then uh, later in the season would be the Feast of Tabernacles. That'll be fulfilled when Jesus returns and sets up his kingdom on earth. But it was in uh, Exodus 23 where God was speaking to Moses on Mount Sinai, and so for 1,500 years, they've been observing this feast of Pentecost, and now it's being you know, celebrated here in Acts chapter 2, the, the feast of Pentecost. The high priest would come out, he would take some new grain of wheat, 
he would grind it up, mix it with leaven. They'd have these two loaves of bread. They would, it was a wave offering before the Lord. And it was a preview of what they were expecting the harvest to be later. You know, it was like, you know, this is the beginning of the wheat harvest. Very ap appropriate that this is the day of Pentecost, the beginning of when the church was born, the beginning of what God was going to do. What a beautiful picture of what God did on this day. And, and the new grain pictures the 120 disciples that are uh, being filled up with the Spirit. But then look over the last 2,000 years, how much fruit has been produced. Millions upon millions of people over the last 2,000 years have been saved. And so these two loaves, again, they contain leaven, uh, way before the Lord. You know, Jews and Gentiles were all sinners who need a Savior. So a beautiful picture of this. Again, in verse 1, he says, When the day of Pentecost had fully come. That phrase, had fully come, literally means finally and fully expressed all that this day was meant to be. In other words, this day... And the full meaning of what God desired for this day has now come to fruition. 1,500 years they celebrated this day, but now it's fully come. It's fully realized by the Lord. He knew all along this is what it was all leading up to. And the same again with Passover. 1,500 years of sacrificing lambs for the atonement of our sins. It was all fully realized when Jesus died as the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. It says, so when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. By faith, they're obeying the Lord. They're trusting the Lord. He said, wait in Jerusalem until you're endued with power from on high. He said, not many days from now. He didn't tell them when, and they didn't know when. They didn't know what was going to happen, but they knew Jesus well enough to know, whatever he says, we're going to obey him. Whatever he tells me to do, we're going to follow through. And so nobody's like, oh, come on, Lord, it's been seven days. Nothing's happening. We're meeting in this upper room. We're praying. I guess he meant something else. I'm going to leave. Nobody did that. They all waited patiently with great anticipation because they knew Jesus. And they knew what he said was true. And I hope you have that same confidence in Jesus today, that whatever he wants to do in your life, you can trust, you can believe, it's going to be a blessing in your life. It's not going to be anything weird. It's not going to be anything goofy. It's not going to be anything scary or dreadful. These disciples knew Jesus. And they knew that whatever he was going to do, it was going to be a tremendous blessing. Again, they're not afraid because they know Jesus. And I hope you know Jesus that well, that well also, that you don't have to be afraid when he says, I want to fill you with the Holy Spirit. He's not going to do something goofy and weird in your life. It's going to be something supernaturally natural. It's going to be a blessing in your life. So many of us miss the blessings that God wants to do and, the, and what the Holy Spirit wants to do in our lives because we don't always trust that He has our best in mind. This is what Jesus says, though, and this is in reference to the Holy Spirit. It's in Luke chapter 11, starting in verse 9. Look at these verses. So I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. He who seeks finds, and to him who knocks it will be opened. If a son asks for bread from any father among you, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent instead of a fish? Or if he asks for an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If you then, being evil, us earthly fathers, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? And so again, do you know and trust Jesus well enough to simply ask Him? Lord, I need to be filled. I need to be refilled today, Lord. I need your strength. I need your power to live the life that you've called me to live. And so these 120 disciples are again waiting on the Lord full of anticipation of what Jesus is about to do, and they're waiting by faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. We have to believe that He is God. He loves us. He's a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. And so we need to trust Him enough to let Him work in our life. Now look at verse 2. It says, And suddenly there came a sound from heaven 
as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Now this is important. Notice a wind did not come into the house, but the sound of a rushing mighty wind came into this upper room, into this place. Some people in churches make it seem like a tornado came into the room and it threw everybody all over the place. They were sticking to the wall. They were on the floor. They're swinging from the chandeliers or whatever they had. No, there was a sound from heaven that filled the house where they were sitting. As far as the scriptures indicate, not one person was knocked out of their chair if they were sitting in chairs. They weren't knocked over, by the way. Think about that. At the very moment when Jesus pours out the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, fulfilling the promise of the Father, nothing weird, nothing goofy, nothing like, oh no, they're Velcroed to the floor, they can't get up. Nothing like that at all. It was the sound of a rushing mighty wind. Nothing to be afraid of. Nobody runs out of the room freaking out. What is this? I can't believe it. Oh no, i got to get out of here. Why? Because they trusted what Jesus told them. That Jesus was going to send another, what? Comforter. I'm sending another comforter. And so they knew who he's sending, the Holy Spirit. It's going to be just like Jesus. Jesus was not weird. He wasn't goofy. He didn't make people flop around like fish out of water. Another thing I find interesting is this word rushing. A rushing mighty wind. The word rushing here in the Greek literally means to bear up and to keep you from falling. Interesting. That's interesting in light of some of these goofballs on TV, like Benny Hinn taking his coat and waving it and knocking everybody over, and others do the same thing. That's not biblical. That's not what the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit was sent to bear us up or to keep us from falling. That's in direct contrast to what some of these guys are doing. Have you ever been in a windstorm that was so strong you could lean into it and not fall over? That's what the Holy Spirit does. When we're getting beat up by the enemy, he's going to hold us up. He's not going to let us get knocked over. That's exactly what the Holy Spirit's supposed to do in your life, keep you from falling. Jude verse 24 says, Now unto him who is able to keep you from stumbling or falling and to present you faultless, before the presence of His glory with exceeding joy, that's Jesus, to prevent you from falling. Now, spiritually speaking, how's your walk with the Lord today? Are you stumbling into sin? Are you falling into unbiblical behavior? Is there a lack of joy in your life? Does it seem like Satan is slapping you around and knocking you over, tripping you up? Well, that's usually a clear indication that you are not filled with the Holy Spirit at that moment because He's the one who will bear you up and give you the strength to keep you from falling. And so we need to rely on the Spirit to give us the strength to resist the lies and temptations of the enemy. There's a beautiful correlation between what the Holy Spirit coming upon these disciples and the filling like a wind. It can also be translated breath, pneuma in the Greek. It's where you get breath, like pneumatic tools, air tools. That's the Holy Spirit, the breath of God coming upon them. There's a great correlation between this and how the Lord created Adam, the first man. It says that he took a handful of dirt and he fashioned Adam into this amazing creature. And, uh, you know, we're often seeing the Lord in the Old Testament pictured as a potter. And we're just a lump of clay, and he's molding us and shaping us into the men and women he wants us to be. By the way, the human body is made up of the same chemicals and elements as common dirt. That should keep you from getting puffed up. You know, if I'm ever thinking, oh, Jeff, you're looking marvelous, and God has a way of saying, you know, without me, you're just a dirt clod. So it's like, okay, Lord, I know, I understand. Anyway, here's... Adam, a fistful of dirt in God's hands, but beautifully arranged dirt. Genesis 2, verse 7. And the Lord God formed man out of the dust, literally dirt of the ground, 
And notice, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. And again, that word he breathed into him, it's like CPR. It's like God you know, put his mouth over and just blew the breath of life into him, and he becomes a living soul, a living being at that moment. And that's what we're seeing here with the Holy Spirit. He's the breath, in a sense, bringing the church to life. The third person of the Holy Trinity comes upon them, and now they're born again, spiritually filled up with the Holy Spirit. And just as God breathed the breath of life into Adam and made him a living being, God has done this same thing, the spiritual breath of the life of the Holy Spirit into his bride. And this is a beautiful picture of what the day of Pentecost really is. So the church comes to life. Now when anyone receives Jesus Christ, that's why Jesus told Nicodemus, you must be born again. Everybody's got a physical body. You have a mind, you're suke, but you need to be spiritually brought to life. And that happens when the Holy Spirit comes into your life. That's what it means to be born again. Spiritually, you're dead to God, but at that moment you receive Jesus, He comes into your life, and now you're born again. Well, look at verse 3. It says, Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. And so here we see something that looked like flames of fire. It says just as fire, you know, flames of fire. And it's, it's, some say it's over their heads, just over their person. And so this group of men and women had this wonderful privilege of seeing the manifestation of the Holy Spirit upon each one of them. So it's similar to when John the Baptist was baptizing Jesus. And when Jesus comes up out of the water, John had the privilege of seeing the Holy Spirit descend upon Jesus in the bodily form of a dove. And so these guys, these gals here in the upper room, they see this manifestation of the Spirit. Now in verse 4, this is the whole purpose behind the Spirit coming. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. That's the key. And began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. But the most important thing is that they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. This is the fulfillment of what Jesus told them to wait for. This is the fulfillment of the promise of the Father, that He would come upon their lives. This is the baptism by Jesus with the Holy Spirit. At the moment of salvation, you are baptized by the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ. Here is the baptism by Jesus with the Holy Spirit, where He now immerses us into the Holy Spirit. So there's two different things at play there. This is where the Spirit would only be in their lives, but now He's upon their lives. Again, the Holy Spirit comes into all believers. He's our source of power and strength. He's the one that enables us to live the Christian life. He's the one that allows us to be a reflection of Jesus and His goodness and His grace. He's the one that, uh, like, you know, tells us in Isaiah 40, verse 31, you know, that those who wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. They'll mount up in wings of evil, e eagles. They'll run and not be weary. They'll walk and not faint, because that's the Holy Spirit working in us and through us. He's the one that produces the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. If you look at that and you say, well, I'm not, you know, hitting, I'm not patient. I have a lack of self-control. Well, then you don't have the Holy Spirit upon you. He's in you as a Christian, but maybe you're not surrendering, yielding your life fully to what He wants to do in and through your life. Throughout the book of Acts, we'll see, see some wonderful and amazing and various manifestations accompanying the Holy Spirit as He comes upon their lives. We'll see the results of being empowered by the Spirit, where it says that the disciples will have boldness to give a hope, you know, an answer for the hope that's within them. We'll see in uh, another time where it says the Holy Spirit filled them, and these are persecuted believers in Antioch, and it says He filled them and they had joy. I mean, that's a manifestation of the Holy Spirit upon your life. You have joy even though you're being persecuted. We see this with some of our church planters in India. They'll, they'll go through persecution. We'll hear families that accept Christ get run out of town. Their houses are burned down. And yet they have the joy of the Lord. 
It's their strength because they're filled with the Holy Spirit. So don't think, oh, I'm going to be filled with the Holy Spirit, so I'm going to be in city market, and I'm going to lose all control. I'm going to run around the fruit aisle and jump up on the fruit and act like a fruit and speak in tongues. And That's not the manifestation of the Holy Spirit according to the Word of God. So we'll see these various things take place over and over again. The Apostle Paul encourages us in Ephesians 5, 18, don't be drunk with wine, which is dissipation, but be, literally means be being filled with the Spirit. And the results are, husbands, you'll love your wife even as, just as Christ loves you, the church. And then wives, be in submission to your own husbands as unto the Lord. And then we can resist the temptations of the enemy. We can live in victory over our flesh. And so there's so many different manifestations of the Holy Spirit when He's working in us and through us. So be careful because there's a lot of people that will say, well, if you don't speak in tongues, then you don't have the Holy Spirit. That's not true. That's, That's a lie from the enemy. All you have to do is read the end of 1 Corinthians 12, and he says, not all are apostles, are they? The answer is no. Not all are prophets, are they? No. Then he goes, not all speak in tongues, do they? Uh, No. No, we all have different various gifts and talents that he's given us. The, The ultimate expression of the Holy Spirit upon our lives is that we will become more like Jesus. That's what he wants. Us to represent him to a lost and dying world around us. And so you look at the life of Jesus. You study his life. He had the Holy Spirit upon him. Was he weird, goofy, do crazy things? No, he was just representing the heart and the mind of God the Father. And the Holy Spirit does the same with Jesus. And you study Jesus' life, and it was like, wow, people were drawn to him. Kids were drawn to him. People weren't like, oh, I've got to get away from this guy. He's weird. No, he's not a Benny Hinn. He's Jesus. He sends his other comforter. What did Jesus look like when he was filled with the Holy Spirit? Ephesians 4, 18 and 19. Look at these verses. This is what it looks like with Jesus. Not Ephesians. Luke. What is it? Luke 4, 18 and 19. There it is. <laughs> I've got to give you the right verse. Sorry. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. This is when Jesus is beginning his earthly ministry. He's in the synagogue there in Nazareth. And he says, Because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. Ooh, that's so weird. No, it's not. That's the natural outflow of the Spirit being upon him. You're going to tell people the good news of Jesus. He says, He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. Oh, I can't stand that. That is just too way out there. Are you kidding me? There's so many people with broken hearts around us. And he wants to use you to minister to them and speak about the love of Christ, the forgiveness there is in Christ, the hope that we have in Jesus, to proclaim liberty to the captives. You can be set free from your sins. You don't have to be a captive to Satan any longer. Nothing weird about that. That's just an amazing thing that the Lord has for us as well. Because again, we're going to be more like Jesus when the Spirit is upon us. Recovery of sight to the blind. God can heal blindness, but he can also use us to help people spiritually see the the truth of who Christ is. To set at liberty those who are oppressed. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. So here in Acts we see Jesus continuing to do these things and much more through his body. Through his multitude of people. Through all of us in here as well. He wants to work in us and through us for his glory. Now here in verse 4, when the Spirit came upon them, uh, something beautiful takes place. It says he gave them the ability to speak with other tongues. Greek word there is glossolalia, and it's the ability to speak in other languages. Languages they did not know or understand, but other people recognized it, as we'll see in a moment. Look at verse 5. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men, from every nation under heaven. Now again, this has all been prearranged by God. Devout Jewish men from all over the known world were in Jerusalem. They were there because it was required of them to be there for the day of Pentecost. So God set this up 
Many had traveled hundreds of miles to be there. God was going to do a radical work in their midst. And then it says in verse 6, And when this sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused because everyone heard them speak in his own language. And so here, the 120 disciples, they come out of the upper room and they've been worshiping the Lord. They're praising God in these foreign languages. And it draws a crowd because they're like, we know that language. And there's 16 languages that are mentioned here. And so they're speaking all these various languages, and the people are amazed. Look at verse 7. See, I told you. Then they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Look, are not all these who speak Galileans? That's not a compliment, by the way. All these hicks from Galilee? Aren't we hearing these guys? Because <laughs> they're like, your, your language you know, makes it obvious where you're from. Even the people, when Peter was denying the Lord, says, Oh, you're a Galilean. I recognize that accent. And so look, not all, are not all these who speak Galileans? And how is it that we hear each in our own language in which we were born? Parthians and Medes, Elamites, those dwelling in Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and parts of Libya, adjoining Cyrene, Visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans, so we had some aliens there, yes, no, just kidding, they're not aliens, from Crete, and Arabs, we hear them speaking in our own tongues, what are they speaking? The wonderful works of God. It's often been said, and we looked at this Wednesday night, that the greatest commentary on the Bible is the Bible itself. So what are they speaking? the wonderful works of God. They were giving praise and worship to the Lord for who He is and for what He has done. That's the simple yet beautiful purpose of the gift of tongues. All scriptural evidence indicates that whenever tongues are spoken, it's directed to the Lord. So I say that because there are those, they're known as cessationists, who say, oh, all these sign gifts are not for today. They all passed after the, the apostles died out. And so they, they just put tongues out. That's not even a gift for today. And they said it was only used back then to proclaim the gospel to these foreigners. There's no evidence in the Bible whatsoever of anybody ever giving the gospel in tongues. Because that would be speaking to men. But here it says we're speaking of the glorious, marvelous things of God. And the only places where we have tongues translated for us, it's directed to the Lord. The other one is when Peter takes the gospel to Cornelius in Acts chapter 10. It's in verse 46. This is when they receive the gospel. These Gentiles are now born again. And it says, For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. They're not preaching in a different tongue. They're magnifying God as they speak in tongues. The proof text to me is 1 Corinthians 14, verse 2, where Paul, you know, in that whole section, talks about the, the gifts and manifestations of the Spirit. For he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God. For no one understands him, however, in the Spirit he speaks mysteries. And so the proper interpretation of anybody speaking in tongues will be, we praise you, Lord. God, you're so awesome. You're so great. Thank you, Jesus, for doing this amazing work in my life. That's the proper interpretation. It was never preaching the gospel. Now, maybe somebody was saying, Lord, we thank you for sending your son Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. Thank you, Lord, that you conquered the grave. But it's always directed at the Lord. It's not directed to people. So keep that in mind. Look at verse 12. So they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, whatever could this mean? Others mocking said, ah, they're full of new wine. Oh, they're drunk. Now we're going to pause here. Uh, Lord willing, we'll pick up next week here in this section. But the point is, Peter is going to give them a scriptural explanation for what they are witnessing. He says, this is that which is spoken of by prophet Joel. It's always important that you're able to say, this is that which Isaiah 
prophesied. This is that which the Apostle Paul said. You know, we don't come up with our own ideas. We go back to what the Word of God says. This is the final, you know, ultimate authority, God's Word. So let me just, you know, close with a few thoughts here before we, you know, worship the Lord. There's a lot more that can be said about the gift of tongues. I've just shared a little bit. I mean, there's a lot of questions. There's a lot of opinions about this gift. But what should be clear to all of us is that we need the power of the Holy Spirit upon our lives in order to represent Jesus to a lost and dying world around us. And on a very, very basic level, God wants to use your tongue to proclaim the goodness and the grace and the hope that we have in Jesus. He wants all of us to talk about the wonderful works of Christ. Now, we all know that the tongue is a powerful little part of our bodies. Uh, we all know that our tongues can be used to build people up. We also know that they can be used to tear people down. Just read James chapter 3. You know, the tongue is a little member, but it can set on fire a great forest. It's a little rudder on a massive ship, but it can steer that ship. That's how powerful our tongues can be. So be careful. This world is in a lot of trouble because of the way people use their tongues. World War I was started by one guy saying something, and then the other guy got upset, and the World War I was the result. Some of you are still suffering. Some of you are still in pain over what somebody said to you, what somebody did to you maybe years ago. And Satan loves to use the tongue to rip people apart, to spread lies, to cause pain, to bring damage into your lives. All you have to do is look at all the media stuff going out there. It gets people confused and upset and angry. Um, look what's on TikTok and all the young people on TikTok that get influenced in a bad way and do horrible things because of stuff through the Internet. There's so many outlets where Satan is using to poison the world, draw people away from God. But on the other hand, when our lives are filled with the Holy Spirit and our hearts and minds are set upon Jesus, He can use our tongues to speak truth, to speak life in the sense that we share the gospel with those around us. And we can minister to people in amazing ways. We can proclaim the hope that we have in Christ. He can wash away their sins. He can give people eternal life. He can set them free from all the garbage that this world has put upon them. Now, some of you might know there are over 7,000 languages in the world. Um, Emily speaks seven. So what is that, one-tenth of one percent? Something like that. He speaks seven languages. I think there's a thousand languages just in India. So they have like one-seventh of all the languages are in India. It's crazy. Here's what God wants us to do. He wants to use whatever language or languages you speak to be his mouthpiece to those around you. Colossians 3, verse 17. And whatever you do, notice, whatever you do in word or deed... Do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. And so as I look at these verses here in Acts, it's very clear. You don't need a PhD. You don't need to be an expert in public speaking. You just need to be yielded to the Lord. Let the Holy Spirit work in you and through you. And you just need to love Jesus, worship God, and He will use you in tremendous ways. And so may the Lord help us to talk about the wonderful works of God Tell others what Jesus has done for them, what he's done for us. The other thing is simply this. We don't need to try and, you know, recreate Pentecost. This was a once and for all happening. The day when the Holy Spirit descended upon planet Earth. The good news is the Holy Spirit has been given and he is available to all of us who are followers of Christ. When I got saved back in 1977, it was towards the end of the what they call the Jesus Revolution or the Jesus Movement. It was a time when the Holy Spirit was moving in powerful ways. When I gave my life to Christ, November 30th, it was a Wednesday night. 
when I came forward, I thought I was three feet off the ground. I mean, all the weight of my sin that I've been carrying for nearly 21 years, it just came off. I mean, I felt so free. It was an amazing time. There was about 50 other people that went forward that night as well. Literally every service I attended there for the next seven years, 50 to 100 people every service. Three services Sunday morning, one Sunday night, Wednesday night, multitudes. Calvary Chapel, San Diego. Mike McIntosh. He was just preaching the simple gospel. And it was awesome how many people were coming forward to receive Christ. And we're like, Lord, we want to see that again. Well, it's the move of the Holy Spirit. We need to yield ourselves to Him. Say, here I am, Lord. And it's amazing how we took so many young people like me, millions upon millions of people getting saved at that time. And He filled our hearts with Jesus' love. He gave us a love for the Word of God. Some of these guys were so messed up. Some of these guys were just so beaten down by life. And many of these guys I'm referring to became Calvary Chapel pastors. They had no business being in the ministry. But by the grace of God. Let me just say that if you are young in the Lord today, and even if you're an old-timer like me, the condition of this world today is screaming out to us, we need what is written here in the book of Acts. We need a fresh infilling of the Holy Spirit upon our lives. You and I need to have a real and meaningful, impactful experience with the Holy Spirit today and tomorrow and the next day and the next week and the next month until the Lord takes us home. You can't run on past fumes. It's like gasoline. you got to keep putting gas in your car. Or if you're into electric vehicles, you got to keep plugging it in because eventually it's going to run down. And so we need to be refilled with the Holy Spirit. It's not just a one-time deal the moment you got saved. Yes, He came in you, but if you're stumbling, if you're tripping up, if you're still getting caught up in the things of the flesh, that's an indication you are not walking in the fullness of what God has for you. We need to ask the Lord to refill us, to use us for His glory, because it's not about us, it's about Jesus. Galatians chapter 3, verses 1 through 3, Paul's very clear, having begun in the Spirit, talking to the church, are you now being made perfect in the flesh? Don't be foolish like the Galatians were. Don't say, well, I was filled, I was saved, now I'm just going to keep going with my life. You need to humble yourself. Having begun in the Spirit, are you going to be made perfect in the flesh? No. How did you get saved? By faith in Christ. How are you refilled with the Spirit? By faith in the Lord. And you simply ask, seek, knock. He's going to give good gifts to all of His children. He's not going to give you a snake. He's not going to give you a scorpion. If you, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in Heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? Not just for salvation, but for empowering to live out this life in which we live. Let's pray. Father, we humble ourselves before you. We know that in and of ourselves we are weak. And Lord, I know that we all struggle with our flesh at times. I know, Lord, that we all give in to the, the carnal man, but we need to reckon the old man dead. We need to take up our cross daily and, and follow you. But we want to follow you in the power of your Holy Spirit, not in the weakness of our flesh. And so, Lord, I pray if there's anyone here this morning, they just feel drained, they feel tired, they, they just feel burned out as a Christian. Lord, I pray that they would just open up their heart to you and allow your Spirit to refill them overflowing with rivers of living water. So often, Lord, we can tell there's just a little drip or a little trickle coming forth from our lives. But Lord, we want the rivers, the torrents of water to flow in and out of our lives so that people will see more of Jesus and less of us. And so, Father, I pray that you would strengthen us and encourage us as we humble ourselves before you. Refill us, Lord, so that we can be the men and women that you've called us to be. Nothing weird, nothing goofy. Lord, it's just by faith receiving what you have for us because you love us and you want to use every single one of us in here for your glory. There's so many people in our neighborhoods, in our workplaces, all around us in this valley 
the need to know that Jesus loves them, that he died on the cross for their sins, that he rose from the dead and he wants to offer them eternal life, forgiveness of sin, a new beginning with God. And so, Father, may you use each one of us here for your glory. And we just thank you. You don't make it difficult. You don't make it hard. The hard part is just denying ourselves and taking up our cross and following you. And so may we do this in the power of your Holy Spirit. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together. Let's worship the Lord. And if you need prayer, maybe you want us to pray for you to, you know, be refilled with the Spirit, then I encourage you to come on down. Again, God loves us and he wants to continue to use us for his glory.